All right, welcome folks. Thanks very much for uh, your, your patience. Uh, you can blame the new head of uh, developer experience in New Zealand, Chris Old, for the, for the delay. Tell him I said so. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, that's one of those things, I guess. We're, we're, we'll, try and, uh, we'll try and finish close to on time still. Anyway, morning. Uh, the, as as the, the lovely usher said at the, at the door, it's afternoon tea straight after this, and who wants to eat after the big lunch we had, right? Yeah, good. Um, welcome. I, I, I want to start with a little bit about me. Uh, not many people know, he said, pressing the go forward button. No. Not many people know that I'm actually an engineer by training. In fact, both my degrees are in civil engineering. And it gives me a certain perspective on things. So having a look at bridges is one thing for someone who's not an engineer, and it's something very different for someone who is an engineer. This is how I see bridges. And it was interesting, it was fascinating, because I was chatting to my daughter about this, who's just finished her HSC, her final, final year of school. And she was wondering what she's going to do. She's tossing up between playing the flute professionally or doing an engineering degree. And she did, um, she did both those things at, at high school very, quite successfully. And, and when we were talking about engineering, we were talking about exactly this. And I said, the interesting thing about this is I still see the beauty of that. That's, that's a gorgeous view, pretty structure and so on. But I also see this. This is how the bridge stays up. And I, this is really... Being able to understand things at this sort of fundamental level and understand you know, more than the average person, perhaps, about, about bridges gives me what I consider to be superpowers. And I don't say that lightly. I think it's one of those fascinating things. If you understand more about stuff, then, you're going to get, then, then, you, then you get a whole lot of additional value out of it. And not only that, not only understanding more about it, you can take advantage of some of the ways that things are, are built. So I'm not going to stretch this analogy too far, but you know, I know that when the wind's up and the, and the bridge is... Um, bridge is uh, about to start swaying, if it's, uh, if it's um, blowing at exactly 56 miles an hour, for example, and it's the Tacoma, uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, it's going to set up a resonant frequency, and now's the time to get your car off before it goes plunging into the river. Um, so those sorts of things are useful to know, and that may or may not be a superpower, but, but there are ways you can think about things in a different way. And I really think that taking advantage of things that other people have built is also a bit of a superpower. Uh, Isaac Newton called it standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, we're not sure whether he was actually talking about uh, getting advantage from other, what other people have done or whether he's having a crack at one of his uh, less, uh, less, statue, less, less uh, height-enabled uh, colleagues. Uh, there's, still, there's still some debate about that. But standing on the shoulders of giants is another superpower. And yesterday I talked about the, the Microsoft graph, and today I'm going to talk about the graph with Xamarin and Xamarin Forms in particular. Can I have a quick show of hands? Who was at my session yesterday? A few, beautiful. Uh, what about, is it, who went to the introductory graph session earlier? I think it was on Tuesday. Yeah. Who's been to some Xamarin form sessions? Yeah, awesome, all right. Who's ever used Xamarin? Who wants to use Xamarin? Yeah, okay, all right. Who's ever used Microsoft Graph? Oh, not very many. Who wants to use Microsoft Graph? Yeah, a few more, excellent. That's, well, we're in a good spot then, eh? Um, my name's Andrew Coates. I've been working for Microsoft for about 13 years now. I am a technical evangelist based in Sydney. I've been across here in New Zealand a few times doing uh, things like this and some other consulting work. Um, and before that, I was a, um, uh, an independent consultant and developer. And particularly, I worked around things in Office because I did stuff for small businesses, and pretty much every small business has got something to do with Office. I built point-of-sale systems, I built uh, ERP systems, I built uh, CRM systems, but all of them really decided in, ended up going back and forth between the various office pieces, whether it was doing mail mergers or sending email or um, getting information out so you can put stuff into a, a spreadsheet. It was all pretty much office stuff. And you know, that, that was all very, very well, all, all well and good. Um, and I took, I took real advantage of the fact that there were some very powerful tools already, that already existed in the office clients. Now, we've taken that a whole step further now, and we talk about the Office graph as well. But when we talk about Office development in general, we've got three things that we talk about. We talk about add-ins and parts. This is where we build things that go into existing applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, OneNote, Outlook, uh, and more and more of those are happening. And that's, that's one of the things we talk about in developing Office, where we leave people in the context in which they are already working, that is, the Office application, but we give them some additional information and additional capabilities. We, we look at how we can take advantage of the services that Office provides, and what, this is what we're particularly focusing on here. And we talk about this concept of voice and video and bots and conversations and so on. And I'm not going to talk about that anymore today, but it, this is one of the things that I think is really fascinating at the moment, this idea of interfacing with applications, interfacing with your 
your information and getting insight from your information using natural language and using the various con you know, connection points you've got, being able to actually converse with people. But as I said, not, no more about that this afternoon. What we're going to concentrate on today is how do we take advantage of this concept of apps that already, uh, sorry, of, of, of services that already exist to do things that we want to get done. So who here has ever written an application interfaces with a, uh, an email client, an email server of any sort? Yeah, a few, right? Did you write the email server? I'm guessing not. Yeah, it's probably not the smartest thing in the world to write your own email server. Okay, who's ever uh, um, written an application that presents information in a grid? Yeah, how many of you wrote your own grid control? There might be a few, yeah, a couple, not nearly as many. Um, uh, and, um, you yeah, know, sometimes you, you take a grid control that already exists and, and modify it a bit as well. But my suggestion is that, you know, there's a pretty good grid control out there that lots, of, lots and lots of, uh, particularly financial people, but lots of other people use as well, that's called Excel. So is there a way you can take advantage of that? Because it does a bunch of things that already happen. And in fact, behind the scenes, it does things that your grid control might not do. So here's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, if I press the right, right arrow button, that'll make a big difference. We're going to talk about Excel and the REST API using the Microsoft Graph. So yesterday, I talked a lot about the graph. Today, I'm going to focus down on the, the, the REST API for Excel. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time showing you REST commands like I did yesterday, because, because we did lots of that yesterday. I'll talk a little bit about the SDK that wraps a whole bunch of those REST calls in, um, in uh, uh, strongly typed uh, objects, or as long as you're using a strongly, strongly typed language, it does. Uh, but there's, there's SDKs in it from a bunch of different languages. And we'll talk a bit about the Xamarin Forms and the promise it brings around uh, write once, run lots of places. Yeah? And then we'll talk about authentication, because somehow you need to go and uh, allow your user, however they're, whatever app they're running, to go and log into things. And then we'll bring it all together with a demo at the end. That's the, the, the plan for today. Um, yeah, right out. So, uh, the Microsoft Graph is pretty awesome because the Microsoft Graph gives us a uh, REST-based interaction with uh, the services at the back end of Office 365. Now, one of the services at the back end of Office 365 is OneDrive or the files service. And one of the cool things about the file service is you can store things like spreadsheets. So let's take that a step further and how can we interact with those spreadsheets as a service? And well, the, the REST API, the Excel REST API in the Microsoft Graph allows us to do exactly that. Basically, it says, well, you can go and grab hold of a reference to a, an Excel sheet, or sorry, an Excel workbook, um, and then you can jump in and uh, write stuff to it, you can read stuff from it, you can create charts, you can update charts, you can do pivot tables, um, pretty much anything you like all through an Office 365 REST API. Now that's pretty clever, uh, and it gives us a, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of capabilities we'll see in a minute, but it does a bit more than that because it's not just uh, in your uh, OneDrive for Business. It's also in Office 365 Groups and SharePoint Online, and soon, not yet, but soon, will also be available on your OneDrive Consumer, all through exactly the same API, which is pretty powerful. Um, we secure access, as we do for all Office 365 pieces, through OAuth 2 and, and Azure Active Directory. And we use a standard JSON REST call to get stuff in and out of the spreadsheet. So now you've got an engine that not only uh, most, lots of people in the world use for all of their numerical and charting requirements, you've got an engine that you can use in your app for doing exactly the same stuff, all through REST. We looked at the graph yesterday a bit, and here's, you know, here's an example of the sort of things you can do. The cool thing is that your, gra your application that lives up here, which could run on pretty much anything, we're going to talk about mobile apps with Xamarin today, but could run on pretty much anything, talks through this API to this single source of truth, which is the Office 365 back end. And it can talk into calendars and mail and, and contacts and uh, files and, and all sorts of stuff. It can look up users and the, the, get insights about the relationships between people. It can do stuff around provisioning and, 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 and identity protection and all that kind of stuff because these are the services that run at the back end that Microsoft provides. And the, offer, the, the Microsoft Graph is this one endpoint, we I said yesterday, one endpoint to rule them all that allows you to go and get at that information through a REST API. So let's drill down into how you do it in Excel. So the way you get at um, a, a, a the REST API in Excel is you say, well, I want to go and talk to the graph. So that's the first piece there. Graph.microsoft.com is always the start of the um, start of the call, and then we've just recently moved the um, the graph, sorry, the, the Excel endpoints into the production-ready V1 endpoint. 
which is nice because now it's actually available in production. You can use it in production, whereas up to, up to recently it was all in beta. Um, and it also means that we've included in the SDK, about more which later. Um, so then we find, then we, when we work out where the file is, so in this particular case it's me, whoever the logged in user is, slash drive, which means they're, they're, uh, they're OneDrive for business, slash items, slash whatever the ID of their file is. So now we've got a path to the file itself. And then finally, we go and say, you know what, I want you to treat this as an Excel workbook. So up until, up until that very last bit in yellow, we're just getting metadata about the file, where it lives, who, who last um, uh, uh, modified it, um, how long it's been worked, whatever, whatever metadata stored about the file. But the last piece says to the graph, and now I want to use this as a workbook. And I want to be able to access all of the capabilities of Excel through this REST API. So that's pretty neat. Here are some of the sorts of things you might, oh, press the right button again, you might be able to do. So, for example, you can go in and manipulate the formatting in a file. So you want to change the background color. Then we go and set, we, we, we do a patch call to you know, graph.microsoft.com slash um, me, sorry, slash v1, slash me, slash drive, slash items, slash d, slash workbook. And then which worksheet are we talking about? And then which range are we talking about? And then we call the slash format, slash fill, and we send it this bit of JSON which says I want it to be pretty much white. Uh, or yellow, or what do we mean? Red. We make it red in this particular case. Yeah? So that's neat. All through a, a call. Now, you can imagine that being able to manipulate a, um, uh, a, um, a spreadsheet through code is, is quite useful. But maybe manipulating, the, um, manipulating the, the colors of it is not so fantastic. So there are other things you can do as well. So maybe on the fly you can create a chart. So again, we do a post. And we say slash charts slash add, and here's a column chart. Where's the source data from? How how do we do this? How do we do the the um, uh, the series, and so on. And there's a bunch of other things you can pass in here, which are all well documented in the in the in the API. But but um, you know you can you can create charts on the fly, and that's pretty cool as well because now not only can you use uh, Excel to store numbers and maybe add stuff up. But you can chart stuff and get that chart back into your application. And I'll show you how we do that in the demo at the end. This is the code we'd actually use to, to get it. But well, I'll, show you, I'll show, you, show it to you in, uh, in, in all its glory, running on uh, three different platforms at the, end of this, uh, at the demo at the end of this. So in this particular case, now we've created a chart. Um, we go and get it back as an image. And it returns it back as a base64 image, a base64 string. And we can do whatever we like with that then. We bring it back and we can convert it to a, a bitmap that we can display on the screen. We can what, whatever you need to do. So that's, this is, again, all programmatic uh, all, all, uh, all the time. So imagine, for example, you have an application that you want to use for people to, um, I don't know, uh, create a, 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 a capture expense reports. And you want to be able to put that information directly into a spreadsheet as part of the expense report. You want people to be able to take a, a picture of a, of a receipt and store that somewhere, maybe in OneDrive. Uh, you want to be able to capture how much it was. You want to be able to categorize it into one of the, you know, the, the 10 categories that your expense system uses. And you want to be able to chart how those expenses are going in real time on, in the app. You can do all of that on a spreadsheet at the back end and have that stuff uh, surfaced on whatever app you're using. And the nice thing about this is that it's using, it's not, it's not storing information locally. It's not storing, although it can, you can, you can take this stuff offline and, and do stuff uh, asynchronously. But it's not storing information locally. It's not, um, it's not making copies of stuff that it's got to go and then update backend systems with. It's actually talking to the single source of truth at the back end to do these things, uh, all through uh, a standard REST API, or if you like, and uh, I like usually, uh, an SDK, uh, a strongly typed SDK that handles all of that other stuff for you. Uh, there's a few more sorts of things we can do here. Um, in this particular case, we can go and uh, use some of the power of Excel itself. So um, uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in this case, we're using the payment function out of Excel. And we're saying, well, you know, rather than me having to remember what the formula is for, for working out the payment or something, uh, and uh, in fact, not just this one, but any of the other literally thousands of other functions that Excel does, I can just pass it that information and have the result returned to me. Um, I can... Uh, go and get data and in a range and sort it uh, and, and get that information back. I can do things like go, have a look at a table and then just get the top three items 
based on the first column. And again, this information might be quite useful displaying you know, that, that top three uh, in, in, a, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a column. What, what, are my, what are my top three most expensive items in, the, uh, in my expenses for this month? Might just be able to come back quickly into the app uh, as, a, as a useful thing. And again, it doesn't matter whether I go into the spreadsheet and enter things manually, or whether I go in, or whether I do it through my application, or whether my, um, my uh, uh, PA has got access to that spreadsheet and does stuff as well. It'll all show up in the same place because it's all part of the same single source of truth. So that's neat. Of course, as I said, because we are, um, we, we, we've evolved somewhat from just using REST calls, uh, we also have APIs, we also have a, um, uh, an SDK around these APIs for a number of different languages. So uh, .NET slash Xamarin and Android SDKs are, in, are generally available, which include the Excel pieces. Uh, in preview, we have a Node.js and a JavaScript API. And the iOS, Ruby, and PHP are coming soon with, the, with their support for, um, for, uh, for Excel. Um, those, uh, those SDKs are all up on the, on the Microsoft Graph um, uh, uh, homepage, and I'll give you a link to that at the end as well. But, uh, that, and that'll be the one, the one thing I want you to take away. So you can stop writing or taking pictures because it'll be one thing at the end, right? Some examples of where you might use uh, Excel REST APIs. So you know, being, bringing data management uh, through to get, um, doing data management automatically, uh, getting existing data in, into applications through, uh, through, from Excel, um, doing some stuff, re worksheet uh, management remotely. Now, I'm not sure that I do huge amounts of worksheet manipulation using the REST API for small things like uh, you know, updating single cells or, um, or manipulating charts, it's not a bad idea. But if you're doing it on a mass scale, then you might want to think about, and you want to do it server-side, you might want to think about um, having a process that uses something like the OpenXML SDK to grab the file, work on it really quickly, and then spit results back to wherever you need to spit it. And that's a, a, an alternative way of doing things. Um, it's a very, very powerful calculation engine. So for example, I've seen a, a number of people set up uh, complex models that expose uh, answers uh, in, in cells and in a spreadsheet that you can get at through a REST call. And so uh, you might have um, you know, four or five inputs that get run through some very complex uh, modeling that, that some, some quant's done for you somewhere and give you a result. And it's, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of accessing those, it's a matter of just pushing those values into the, into the input cells. Excel will do the calculation stuff for you and just grabbing the output and, and displaying it however you want and it comes back as JSON, so that's easy to do. And a bunch of cool reporting stuff as well. Um, the SDK specifically targets the V1 branch of the graph, which now includes, as I said, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Excel pieces for uh, um, .NET slash Xamarin and Android in GA and in preview uh, for some of those others as well. Uh, and the beautiful thing about it is that we haven't tied the SDK to a specific way of authenticating. We just, the SDK says, uh, you need to authenticate and, and give me a way of obtaining the token. And it could be something as simple as, whenever I ask for the token, call this delegate, which returns the string, which will work for as long as the token's uh, valid. Or it could be something far more involved, like using one of the authentication libraries that we've got, like the Active Directory authentication library or the Microsoft authentication library. And we'll talk a bit about MSAL in a minute. A ADAL is the, is the one that's in production and targets oh, and, um, a, uh, the, the earlier version of the, the, um, the authentication piece. Um, the V2 app model, you need MSAL for, and that's the one that I'm going to recommend that you use, uh, but it's only still in preview at the moment. Um, as I said, it's, it's available on a bunch of different platforms. And the beautiful thing about it is if you know how to use the SDK, in fact, if you know how to use the REST calls, but if you know how to use the SDK in one language, it's very, very similar in others. So here's a, a slide I showed yesterday where um, in C Sharp, if you want to go and do something with a uh, particular user, like if you want to go and get access to uh, the, the currently logged in user, if in C Sharp you just say, you know, var user equals graph service, blah, 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 dot get async, it's a very similar call to do it in Java and a very similar call to do it in, in Objective-C. And either way, you get back a strongly typed user object with, uh, with properties that, that correspond to all the pieces. All right. The last thing I want to talk about with Graph is that we have um, the, the SDK is actually generated using a tool called Viper, or codename Viper. And Viper is a, um, a tool that takes the metadata out of the Microsoft Graph and runs across a bunch of T4 templates for the various um, 
for the various uh, uh, um, uh, platforms that we're targeting. So it's very easy for us to keep the, the, um, the, the SDK up to date when we release new stuff into V1 of the, the, um, uh, of the uh, uh, graph. And we, we, just run, we just run Viper across it. Now the nice thing about this is that it's open source and it's up on GitHub. And if you have a language that for which we don't create an SDK, it's actually perfectly feasible, I won't say it's easy, but it's perfectly feasible to grab the Viper uh, tool, create some templates of your own that will create an SDK for your particular language. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's something that people, that, that certainly some people are already doing. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that, uh, that's out there. And I think this is one of the, the key things about, particularly the graph, is lots of it's being developed in the open using tools that we're making open source uh, as much as possible. So that's pretty cool. Right, that was a, a, a whirlwind uh, dive through the graph and particularly the Excel REST APIs in the graph. And what I want to chat about now is a bit about Xamarin Form, so we'll change, we'll change tack a little bit. Now Xamarin is a, is a, a very, very neat tool, which of course Microsoft acquired uh, a little, little while ago. Uh, and the idea is that you can write a bunch of shared code to target multiple platforms and multiple platforms being iOS, Android, Windows, Windows Phone, um, so RT and UWP, uh, then uh, also Mac uh, and, uh, and um, Apple Watch um, and so on. So, so the Xamarin Forms won't necessarily do the, the Apple Watch piece, but, the, but you can do with Xamarin, you can, you can do things like Apple Watch and, and, uh, and Android watches. Uh, again, all written in C Sharp or F Sharp if you're an F Sharp junkie. We've got a, we've got a C Sharp uh, Xamarin person over here in the crowd. Um, but if you're, if you're an F-sharp person, then you can write it in F-sharp as well. And the beautiful thing is that most, if not, not always all, but most of your code, the vast majority of your code is common across all the platforms. Yeah? Uh, and particularly if, you are, um, uh, if, if you're willing to work within the constraints of Xamarin Forms, which we'll talk about in a moment, which, uh, then almost all of your code is written in, a com in the common library, in a, or sorry, in a common, a common place. And then you have uh, almost stub projects for each of, the, each of the platforms so you can produce the appropriate uh, native file. Because all of these things, and this is a key point, all of, these all of these platforms have a native application built for them. So if you're writing, if, if, you, if you want to output a, a Windows uh, application, then you get a, a standard Windows DLL that comes out that uses .NET and, and, uh, and can be pre-compiled. If you uh, write a, 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 an app for iOS, then you get a proper app that is, that is compiled through the entire iOS tool chain and produces the .exe file that gets uh, deployed to the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the iOS device. If you write an Android app, then you get you know, um, yeah, just-in-time compilation. It compiles into bytecode, it gets deployed and gets just-in-time compiled on the device as well. Exactly the same way as if you would if you wrote in, in Xcode or in Swift for iOS or if in, you wrote in Java for Android. Uh, it's exact, it, it uses native controls truly native controls on and has a truly native uh, application that comes out the other side, which is very different from some of the other cross-platform approaches that you might have seen, where basically you wrap up a bunch of HTML and hope it looks a bit like the native platform. Can you tell which one I prefer? <laughs> I'll I, I, I try not to show my bias. Um, we'll look at some of this stuff in, in, in more detail in the demo as well, but I want to make sure that um, we've got a bit of time to do, some, uh, to do some demos and things. All right, so... Um, Xamarin Forms is, uh, is, is a, a very, very neat uh, abstraction away from the native controls that go on these various platforms because it gives us um, a, bunch of, a bunch of primitives that we can work with. We get some pages and a bunch of different page types here. So you know, content pages and master detail pages and navigation pages, tab pages. And each of these things has a slightly different, um, a slightly different uh, uh, way of working, but they all allow you to... Um, they all allow you to display content on a page, and they all display content in a slightly different way on the various different platforms, because the the, um, the iOS design design language is different from the Android design language, which is different from the Windows design language, and so you want those differences to be reflected in each of those three platforms. And so, while we have a concept of a thing called a content page, that, or a uh, or a navigation page, or even a tab page, is, is probably the best one, um, those things will look different on different different platforms. So a tab page in, um, uh, in Windows might use a, uh, a pivot control or a, um, or, 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 or a uh, um, the other control I'm thinking of, it, well, tab, tab control. Whereas a, um, uh, on, on iOS, the, uh, the tabs will be down the bottom and have different, different icon types and those sorts of things. 
but the definition of them in your code is the same either way. It's just the way they get rendered at, uh, uh, at compile time. Uh, in addition to those pages, pages contain a thing we call layouts, and there are a bunch of different layout types which, will, um, w w which you can work with. Uh, the, um, we've got uh, you know, the stack layout where things just, just pile down the page. We've got the scroll view there in the middle that, uh, where if, if, if you've got too much information, you can just push up and down. And again, these things get rendered in the appropriate way for their, for their application. And then in the control space, we've got a bunch of different controls, and each of these are, um, are rendered as the appropriate control the appropriate native control in um, in the platform which you're running it. So, you know, a um, a label, for example, gets rendered on um, uh, on Windows as a text box. Sorry, text block. A label gets as a text block. Uh, activity indicators are different from progress bars and so on. So all that stuff is available and gets rendered in an appropriate way for each platform. Um, we can, we can uh, define our UI in a couple of ways. The first way is using uh, a, a variant of XAML, which, uh, have we got any XAML developers in the room? Excellent, so you guys will be pleased with this. This is, this is neat, I love this. Um, this is my favorite way of doing things because uh, it worked, all the data binding and stuff works here. It's not exactly the same XAML as, as, um, as Windows or, or as Silverlight or as WPF, but that's okay, it's very similar and you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up really quickly. Um, uh, and um, the other way you can do it is you can define all of your uh, application in code. So either of those two ways of doing this will end up looking like this. And you can see here we've got it rendered on three different platforms, exactly the same, exactly the same code rendered on three different platforms. And you can see there are a few things that are different here. So um, in iOS, we've got um, our tabs down the bottom. Um, the uh, the the button's been rendered a particular way, uh, and, and the, place, the placeholders for, um, for the username and password are, are visible there, but only just. Uh, in, in Windows, it's slightly different again. Tabs are up the top, and in, um, in Android, it's different again with just underlines and so on. But you can see that we're doing, taking advantage of the natural, sorry, of, the, of the, native, um, the native controls for each of these platforms, although all we're doing is rendering the same code or the same markup each time. So you know, an entry with a placeholder gets rendered in one way on Windows and gets rendered in a different way on iOS. All right, are there any questions about that, the Xamarin Forms piece? Yes, up the back. Are the controls customized? That's an awesome question. Thank you, because I did mean to bring that up. In fact, I could have planted you back there and had that. that was <laughs> just um, Yes, absolutely. The controls are customizable. You can build custom renderers for controls and a bunch of other things as well. Uh, and a lot, there are lots of them out there already. So one of the things I'm going to show you in this, in the demo that I show you later on, is a is a library called um, uh, um, Fresh, MVVM Fresh. Anyway, by a guy named Michael Ridlin, who and I just I grabbed one control out of it that I wanted because Zam, by default Xamarin Forms doesn't have a bindable drop down list, a bindable picker, and he's written as a bindable picker which is based on the Xamarin Forms control and renders appropriately on all of the the various platforms. And you can write your own, and there's a bunch of other people who are building, building them as well. Did you have a question up the front here as well? Yeah, awesome. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. So if you're going to use the Microsoft Graph on a bunch of different platforms, you've still got to find some way that you allow people to log in. Because you need to, they, they're going to need to give their credentials. So they, or to Azure Active Directory so that you know what bits of the graph they've got access to. And so, in fact, so the graph can actually uh, uh, allow or deny that access, in fact. So there's a couple of things you need to do to make this stuff work. So the Microsoft Authentication Library is the one I'm going to talk about, although you can also use the Active Directory Authentication Library, ADAL, and we'll talk about when you might use those. Uh, the first thing you've got to do is you actually got to register your app. So one of the things about um, Active, Azure Active Directory or, about, or any of these OAuth pieces is that the, the server side, the, the, the party that's granting permissions, needs to know enough about the app that it, that it knows whether people are registered to use it. And you can do that directly with um, Azure Active Directory. You can go into Azure Active Directory for, for the tenant. You can go to the Active, sorry, so you can go into the Azure portal. You can go to the Active Directory tab. You can go into the Applications area, and you can add an application there. And that was, up until recently, pretty much the way to do it. Uh, and in fact, lots of the early documentation that's still hanging around tells you that's the only way to do it. It's not the case anymore. Um, the, 
the thing about this, um, the thing about this, this V1 approach well, is twofold. One is it only works with Azure Active Directory. It doesn't work with the, uh, the, the personal or consumer logins that, we, that we're seeing people using with um, Microsoft, uh, sorry, with, with Outlook.com or uh, Hotmail or, or Live. Um, the other thing is that you have to declare up front that it's going to have access to the graph, this particular application, and you have to declare up front exactly the permissions it will, it will require, all of the permissions it will require. And so this results in, when someone logs in, this results in the, the user being presented with this long laundry list of anything your app could possibly do. And of course, most of the time, users go, sure, why not? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? We've all been there, right? That's, we've, we've seen what's gone wrong. But the, um, but, but the, but the, the new view, the, the, the new app model is called App Model V2. I don't know how we come up with these crazy names, but um, you, you actually register it a different way. It still puts an entry in an Azure Active Directory at the back end, but it does a bunch more stuff around permissions where it says, you know what? Whenever you request a resource, just pass the permissions that you're going to require for that resource along with it. And if we haven't already asked the user if it's okay to have access to that thing, we'll prompt them at that stage. If they've already given you access to that thing, no problem, away you go. But if you haven't, then, then we'll ask them then. So if you haven't asked them whether you can send email yet, that's fine. The first time they want to send email, they've probably clicked the send email button. And that's when you pop up the dialog that says, is it okay? You know, your application wants to send email, is that all right? And they go, yeah, of course he does, he just asked you to. And we're all good. But you haven't also asked them whether you can read their contacts list and I don't know, update their calendar and those sorts of things, which you don't need to do yet. And so this new, new model says you only ask for permission as you need it. And the Active Directory at the back end keeps track of whether consent has been given for that particular action yet or not. Yeah, and will prompt the user if it hasn't. So that's cool. I, I just I chucked this thing down the bottom here because I'll, and I'll show you the, the, um, the app registration portal in a minute, but I, I just, I love it how these little pearls of wisdom scattered all over the internet, like, just spend your time building the parts of your app that add value and differentiate it from the crowd. Yeah, which is a nice way of saying, only write the code that only you can write. Yeah, don't bother writing the code that someone else has written and is testing and is maintaining and, and, and is updating. Only write the code that only you can write because that's the value you add as a developer. It's your understanding of the particular business problem. It's your understanding of the, of, of the, of the business processes. It's your understanding of the way the things work together in that for that particular application that, give, that, that, provide, that, that you provide value from. You're not providing a whole lot of value writing a standard generalized entity frame, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 object relational mapper as, as a general rule. There are people who are, but I'm guessing that most people in this room are not in that, in that category. You're probably not adding a lot of value writing a, um, a mail server. Because again, there are people who do that for a living and, and do it at huge scale. So only write the code that only you can write is what it's saying at the bottom there. All right. Again, the other button. There's a few gotchas that I want to just call out here. And, and I'll show you this in the demo as well, but I just want to make sure that we've covered them off. The first one is when you create a new Xamarin Forms application, by default, it, um, uh, the um, the, 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 the portable class library profile it creates is actually called 111. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here, but basically portable class libraries are a way of targeting um, the, the intersection of the, the .NET framework that is uh, available from the various uh, technologies. So if you've got a Silverlight application, it has a, a particular subset of .NET framework. And if you also have a WPF application, it's got another subset of .NET framework. There's some intersection of those. Those two, they're not all, there's not all intersection. If you also add a Xamarin piece in there, then it's got another intersection. And the, the, the profile tells the compiler and tells the, uh, the tools what the, that intersection is between all the things that you want to target. Because the great thing about a portable class library is it will run on any of the targeted platforms. Yeah? And so um, uh, PCL uh, profile 111 actually includes Windows Phone 8. Now, the problem is that MSAL doesn't handle Windows Phone 8, and so you can't add the MSAL libraries to a, one one, a Profile 111 PCL. You need to change the PCL to, P, to PCL um, Profile 7, and the only way to do that is to actually unload the project, open the, the, the CSProj file uh, in, in XML Editor, and change it to, to number 7 at the moment. 
So that's being fixed, but it's not yet. Last I looked, it wasn't yet done. And I'll show you where that is in the, um, in the demo as well. Um, another couple of little gotchas that we'll talk a bit more about in the demo, but I want to make sure I call out here. Um, for both Android and iOS, you are going to have to put, even if you're using Xamarin Forms and you wouldn't normally have anything in the, in the iOS and Android uh, um, projects, you will have to put a custom page renderer that is specifically written for each of, the, each of those platforms in those platform-specific projects because the um, uh, Microsoft Authentication Library needs to know how to pop up the dialogue to ask for, the, for your credentials and then come back and know where it's coming back from. And it uses, it uses information that's different in each of the various platforms to do that. Now, by default, it works on Windows, but it doesn't work by default on um, Android and iOS. So you put a custom page render in there to give it the additional information it needs to go and get that stuff. And I'll, I'll show you where to find it. In fact, there's a, there's a link there uh, to, a, to a blog, and I've got those in the, in the resources at the end as well. A couple of other little things that are worth knowing about, um, just if you're doing Android dev on, um, uh, on, uh, on Visual Studio. First one is uh, you want to turn off fast deployment uh, in, the, um, in the Android build, uh, in, in, in the properties of the Android project. Um, it just uh, it, it makes a whole bunch of things work better. Um, you want to enable um, uh, cross-machine CPU support in Hyper-V for the Android emulator. So you do that in, in the Hyper-V manager. And again, these are the things you can refer back to later on. In the Hyper-V manager, you go into the settings for that particular, um, that particular emulator. Uh, and once you get into settings, then you go down to the compatibility mode under the processor, and you turn on the migrate to a physical computer with a different processor version. And those are things that that, um, that, will, that will make your life a whole lot easier because they will, they will avoid some quite um, uh, uh, insidious, and mostly insidious because they are uh, almost randomly occurring uh, problems, but these seem to f these, these fix them. All right, so I've chatted for some time. Let's hook in and actually bring it all together with a bit of a demo. Okay. Oh, the other thing I quickly wanted to talk about that, that, that I, that when I start the demo is I want to talk about my development environment. Who here does any uh, Xamarin Dev? Yeah, a few of you. Um, iOS Xamarin Dev? Yeah. Uh, uh, Android and Windows? Android Xamarin Dev? Windows Xamarin Dev? Yeah, didn't think there'd be very many of them. Why would you just do Windows Dev, Dev on Xamarin? But you know, maybe because you want to do other things as well. Um, so what I've got here is I've got two machines. I've got my, um, my Windows box and I've got uh, a Mac. And my Mac is um, uh, a MacBook Pro. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Uh, but I do need a Mac somewhere on my network so I can actually do Xcode builds. Because what happens is that the Windows machine connects across the network, talks to Xcode, pushes all the, uh, all the files across, does the, gets, gets the compilation, gets the exe file back so I can go and deploy it. And that, that's how it works. Now, I can't complain too much that, that, um, that, the, that the Apple guys require you to have a Mac to build for iOS because you know, we kind of require you to have a Windows machine to build for Windows. So it's, you know, Perhaps not, uh, not, not an unreasonable thing, but you do need a Mac somewhere on the network. Uh, it is possible to share it with others. You just can't be using it simultaneously. Uh, and um, I actually have in my, in my office at home a little Mac Mini, you know, three or 400 bucks, whatever they are, um, uh, that sits on the shelf purely as my build server, and I connect to it. Uh, it's just harder to carry that around uh, and, and use it as a general rule. The other thing is that um, lots of the time, and the, and the reason I'm using my, my Windows device here uh, in, in, as opposed to just using the, the Mac, which I also do sometimes, uh, is that I quite like having a touch screen to be able to do this stuff on the, on the emulators. But the, um, the Mac running um, uh, Fusion or, or Parallels is actually quite a capable machine for doing Windows dev and, and um, uh, iOS dev on the, on the same physical box. And in fact, lots of the time, that's all I'll take to a, to a customer side if that's what I'm doing, if I'm doing um, uh, uh, cross-platform dev. Pretty useful stuff. Right. So let's hook in, as I said, to do this. So I need to go across to here. Number six. And I have an application here that, um, that I've got up on GitHub so you guys can have a look at it. What I'll do is I'll pop it up so we can all see it. A whole lot better, isn't it? Um, and what I'm going to do is, in the Solution Explorer, I'm going to show you the components of the, of the application. So Windows Plus. Let's just make that a little bit smaller. There we go. All right. So there are four things in this application, in the, in the solution. There is a portable class library, which is the one at the, the top there, they're called uh, Excel Forms Test Brackets Portable. There is uh, an Android uh, application, 
which is very simple, uh, and I'll, I'll show you the contents of that now, perhaps. Um, hasn't got a lot in it. It's got this page renderer that I, um, that I, I told you about, and that's, the, that's really the only thing that's the custom in here, um, as, uh, as well as the properties page that I told you about before we turned, uh, turned the, uh, the fast deployment off. Uh, we've got an iOS application, which is, again, similarly small. It's got some, some resources and things, but most of this stuff just comes automatically. It, but it has this page renderer as well. And finally, we have a UWP application, which has nothing special at all about it. It's all done uh, out of the box. The thing with the place where all the magic happens is up here in this portable class library. And the portable class library uses an MVVM pattern to, uh, to, to define what this application looked like. So it's got a bunch of models um, in prop, uh, for property information and files. It's got view models for defining how the model should be displayed on, in a view and all, giving all of the, the, um, the functionality for, for actual, all the business, business work. And it's got the views. And the views are what get rendered on the screen. And the views are all, in my case, XAML files with code behind, with, with, with C-sharp code behind. So um, the way this starts off is we go, if we go into app.cs, uh, Windows Escape, I'll go into the app.cs file, and you'll see what happens here is that we just create a new view, this main view. Yeah, that's, all, that, that, that's what the app.cs file does. It's basically, that's in the constructor. And everything else is, uh, is pretty much standard. Now, the constructor then goes off and says, well, the main view goes off and says, well, I know what my view model is for this. And I've, I've, this is the pattern I've chosen. This is not the pattern you're required to use for, uh, for, for Xamarin Forms. But it is one that I think works really well. Uh, and there's a few really nice uh, MVVM frameworks out there specifically for, um, for, for um, Xamarin development. MVVM Cross, um, Fresh MVVM, uh, and a few others. Uh, Laurent's done some really nice work with MVVM Lite uh, as well. So there's a bunch of great frameworks out there that, that do MVVM. So I would... If you're building any sort of real application, then, then finding a, a decent MVVM framework is, is something that I'd strongly recommend you do. Um, this, so the, the MVVM framework I've, I've got here is actually very simplified. It's made up of a, a, a base view model uh, and a command, a base command, and everything else is kind of run off that. So there's a whole bunch of things that I'm taking advantage of in, in Xamarin Forms, including navigation, that, um, that the MVVM framework doesn't provide. Uh, but you can choose to use that or not use that, depending on how you like to go. Uh, and the main view model, simply has um, the standard sort of stuff you'd see. It's all just C-sharp code. Now, the nice thing about this is we're running C-sharp code regardless of where we run it, on iOS, on Android, uh, on Windows. It's the same code running the same UI, uh, running against the same back end. Yeah. Um, we've got dependency injection as part of the, the, the Xamarin Forms piece. We've got uh, a navigation model as part of the Xamarin Forms piece. Uh, and again, that's all just provided out of the box. So. Let's run it up and, and, and see how this works. In fact, before we run it up, I'm just going to grab this incognito window. I know you can't see it, but I'll show it to you. Um, I'm going to log in to my office, um, office portal. Not that it ever works, but we'll give it a go. So in here, I've got um, OneDrive. And in my OneDrive, I've got a, a folder called Apps. I'll talk about this folder in a minute because it's quite an important one. Uh, and then in this thing called the Aggregator Service. And I have an expenses.xlsx file. Now, this expenses file is the, is the place where all my data is being stored about, a, um, uh, about my expenses. And, and this is where I'm putting all the information. Um, these uh, receipt IDs, by the way, are simply IDs that identify in the graph a file, which is a receipt image. I'll show you how we get those in there in a sec as well. But over on this page here, we've got some analysis. Uh, we've got a pivot table and that sort of thing. Yep, so standard sort of stuff. Or where are we spending our money? Awesome. So I just want to show you that's what, that, that's what is there. Now, I'll go back to Visual Studio. And I'm going to start off by running this up. Um, oh, actually, let, let's, let's take a risk and we'll run it up in, in uh, iOS. 
well, not so much risk, but we'll we'll start off at the at the good end, at the you know what I think is the, the the pointy end of this. So we'll make this a startup project, and then I'm going to say I want to run it on an iPhone simulator, and let's run it on I don't know an iPad or Retina. And what's happening, by the way, is my um, Visual Studio in the iOS uh, uh, tools, tools iOS menu knows about the agent that's going to be used to create to to um, to actually do the the build. So it knows where the Mac is that it needs to go and send stuff to through this linking dialog. And so you can see here that I'm linked to a particular machine here, and I'm just going to hit go. So that'll do a build and there's restore, and I'm just going to pop across to my Mac. And in a moment, you'll see the iOS simulator start up. He said, hopefully. Of course, I can't see the screen that's building on anymore, so if I get a failure, I won't see that happen. Let's just duck back and make sure that nothing's gone wrong. Nothing can go wrong. Can go wrong. Can go wrong. Oh, no. Launching. Okay, good start. Excellent. Here comes our simulator. There it is. There's the iPad Retina. It's kicking off the, um, the app. And I've got this beautiful um, UI that you'll see in a moment. Any second now. He said with... Uh, home button, see what happens. Maybe it's not started yet. Okay. Oh, I see. That's because it's right up here. Because um, I need to rotate it. Let's do that. It was running at the wrong resolution. So let's just, uh, can I bring it? In fact, I'm going to hit stop over on here. We'll do that one more time. Serves me right for not testing on this. Let's stop here. Go back to here. I'm just going to go uh, view zoom. Uh, where's my view? Window zoom scale 50%. There we go. And I might even rotate it. Device rotate left. Okay, so now I've got a. Now it's going to be easy to see. We'll duck back to here. Run up our. Run up our device again doing its build, it's doing its launch, in fact it should just be launching, we go back to HDMI, there we go, there's our iOS and, should have known because we saw it when we go back, okay, so here's, our, here's my application, I know you're all in awe of my wonderful UX skills, yeah, but basically I've got in here, I've got a label and I've got a button and another button, essentially, that's it. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to hit the button that says sign in. And the Microsoft Authentication Library is going to kick in and go, oh, I'm going to see if I can sign you in. Now, there we go. This might look like a, a, a familiar screen to you. Yeah? This is the screen that says, oh, you want to sign into Azure Active Directory. And it looks the same on pretty much any device that you get it from. Who do you want to sign in as? Well, I've been here before. So I can forget that person if I want to. I can just say, yep, I want to log in as me. Um, yeah. Using my super secret password. Oops. <laughs> so super secret that. Did I get it right that time? Did anyone see? There we go. So now I've signed in and it knows who I am. Logged in as Andrew Coates. So now I've connected off to the Azure Active Directory and I've, I've sent it a thing saying, hey, tell me about who you are. And it knows who I am. So now I can look at a bunch of things. I can say, um, show me all the Excel files that I've got access to. And what it'll do is it'll go off and get those Excel files. There's a bunch of them here, and it just goes and does a query against the, the, the back end. Um, it should be, whoops, I don't want that, I want this. Expenses.xls is the one I'm going to use in a minute, but that's okay. Um, I can also go and have a look at the groups that, I'm, that, that are available on this system. So if I look at all the groups, um, I've got a bunch of these. And notice it's doing some stuff asynchronously in the background. It's going off and getting photos. So none of this stuff has to happen asynchronously. It got me the list really quickly. And in the background, it went off and get me, got me some additional information, and it surfaced that yeah, as we go. So just standard sort of coding stuff, but all really easily available in forms. 
This back button, by the way, is available because I'm using a navigation page. And a navigation page uh, is one of those, it's one of the things that Xamarin Forms provides automatically. So we'll go back here and let's have a look at my expenses. So, do you remember what was in my expense list before? Well, here it all is right here. This has gone off and read that, that table and had a look at all the things that are in there. Um, I can go and have a look at a, an expense and if I've got a, um, a receipt associated with it, it'll go and pull that down from the, um, from the uh, from OneDrive as well. And the beautiful thing about this is, because this is an HTTP call, I can use caching all the way around the place. It's just a call, just a REST call. I know that that's pretty much cacheable. Yeah? And I don't, it means I don't have to go back and do the, do that, um, the, the round trip to the, to the back end all the time. Um, and, of course, I can go and grab that chart. It's just straight out of the same, same place. Just pulled down as a JPEG. It's pulled down as a, as a, um, as a bitmap, essentially, as a Base64 encoded um, PNG file, actually. Then re converted back to a bitmap and displayed on the screen. Yeah. So let's just check. Um, if I were to go back and make a change to, say, the connectivity, um, uh, maybe this guy got it wrong, and Telstra probably actually charged me a whole bunch more than $107.02. So maybe it was a $1,070.20 instead. So if I, refresh, if I update that, let's see. Sometimes this takes a moment or two. Ah, my connectivity has gone way up. So now in real time, I'm getting charting updates. So I don't know if you remember before, my connectivity cost was down here somewhere. And now that I've realized that I've come to New Zealand and Telstra's gouging me for the, for the amount that I'm spending as I'm here, uh, the connectivity price has gone way up. Yeah? So this is pretty neat. You, all of this stuff is, is, very, is very straightforward. I'm gonna, we're going to delve into some code in a sec. All right, but I do want to show you that this runs on more than just iOS. So I'm going to get out of here. Uh, there. We'll go stop this. Um, we can run it up on Android if you like, but I'm actually, it's probably just going to be quicker to show you it running on Windows. So it runs the same thing. So let's just make the universal project the default project. Uh, we'll run it on the local machine. Well, it needs to be deployed first because what I've done is I've forgotten to do this. I don't want it to be in the iPhone simulator. Uh, It's hard to run that uh, Windows application on the iPhone simulator. In this stage, in this case, it's not going across anywhere to do the build. It's doing the build on a local machine. Yeah, the build could happen somewhere else if you wanted to, but, but in this case, it's happening on a local machine. Uh, and what you'll see over here when I bring it across is pretty much the same application. It looks slightly different because it's rendered on a, in a, on a different platform. But again, I can sign in. I get a slightly different experience this time. On Windows, it pops up a dialog that rather, rather than using the the window that it was already in, it pops up another dialog. And here we go again, I can list my files if I want to, I can just go straight into the expenses and all the expenses are there. And by the way, notice that this connectivity piece has been updated to 1070 because it's the same data. I'm not having to take it off here and try and route it somewhere to put it, it's sitting in the same place, sitting in an Excel spreadsheet up in, up, up in um, OneDrive for Business. So this is not the limit of what I can do, by the way. Um, I was limited by the, by the um, simulator over there. But over here, if I want to add to this uh, connectivity piece a, um, a picture that's of, of, the, um, of the, uh, the receipt, let's do that. Here's a picture of the receipt. Beautiful, we'll use that whole thing. Uh, okay, and now that gets uploaded to OneDrive uh, and also cached locally, and now that's associated with that particular thing. And what's more, when I go over to when I go over to here, let's have a look at what that ID. Well, in fact, it's not going to help me much. There's a new ID on there, and this one is zero one BD. Uh, ending in K6. Let's see if we can find that one. So we'll go back to here. No, it's just a JPEG. Well, hang on. Where's the one that got, just got added now? Let's do this. Uh, Ta-da! That, that, that image is being stored in OneDrive. And the reference to it is happening. Aren't you pleased that you guys have <laughs> featured front and center of my... <laughs> 
<laughs> if anyone wants to come back and have a look at this later on, it'll be online. If you want to point your, your, your family and friends to it to say, look here, I was there, then, then he can. Um, <laughs> should have told you before I take that photo, shouldn't I? But the nice thing is that this is all being stored in a central location still. And if I went back to the, to the one on, on iOS, that image would be brought down so it was cached locally and, and easy to use, yeah? Whenever I needed it. So this is pretty neat stuff. So that's how the applica that's what the application does. Let's have a quick look at how it works. So we'll come out of here. Uh, I'll sign out. I'm signed out. Uh, let me just kill it there. Kill it with fire. Beautiful. So as I said, all of the all of the important stuff happens over here in the um, in, in the in, in the, the shared the shared pro project. And the nice thing about this is if you guys want to download and play with it, it's all up on GitHub. I'll tell you about where that is at the, at the end. Um, but it basically is made up of some interesting services. Now, the, the, the data service is the thing that actually goes and talks to the Graph API. Now, I wrote this data service before we, um, before we uh, uh, GA'd uh, the, the Excel pieces. And so we didn't have the Excel bits in the, um, in the SDK. So this is all done with REST calls which is fine. Um, let's have a look at some of the things we can do. So I've got some, I've got some basic things here. Graph.microsoft.com is always where you go. Um, I've got a graph version, which I've called beta, um, and, and so on and so on and so on. The things that are interesting, I think, are, let's go and get a chart. Let's go and um, get chart as image, get chart image as base64. So Ensure config, by the way, just checks that, that we're connected and stuff. That's what this does at the back end. So if we're not, if we're not connected, then just return nothing and, and, and carry on. We build up a query string, and the query string is made up of the, oh, by the way, this is the new C Sharp 6 syntax. You, you guys all seen this, it's pretty neat. Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, we build up this query string. The query string's made up of the base graph URL and the version and the base item path and whatever our workbook ID is, which we've stored somewhere, and then we say we want to treat it as a um, treat it as a workbook, we go and find the worksheets and whatever the name of the chart sheet is, where our charts live, and we go and get our chart one, and we get it back as an image. And we just go and do get string async on that query string using the HTTP client. And this works exactly the same way whether I'm using iOS or Android or Windows. It lives in the portable class library. It's just making an HTTP call off to go and get back whatever gets returned. And what gets returned is a chart graph object, which is my POCO for what comes back, and I deserialize it into that. Where the JSON comes back, and, and then in, and then I, I deserialize into a chart object, and then I have whatever that value is. So if you want to look at, want to, find, want to see what this is, um, the chart graph object basically comes back as the context and whatever the value is, because that's, that's, the, um, that's the, uh, the JSON that comes back, yeah? Those two things. It's very straightforward. I built this, by the way, with the JSON to C Sharp uh, engine, which lives on the web. It's a great way of just quickly going, creating a POCO that goes along with whatever the JSON payload is. All right, so we can do that. We can, uh, but the, the other important thing we want to do is um, make sure that we're logged in. So when we click sign in, I have a, um, in the Solution Explorer, let's go into our, our main, main view. That'll do. Demo.cs. Um, actually, it is. The main view says sign in, and I've got a login command in a, in a view model. So let's go and see what that does. And the view model, the, 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 uh, the view model log lives with this is main view model. And my login command, main view model, it's not doing it. That's what I called it, wasn't it? The main, main view.xaml. Oh, the application view model, sorry, is where the login happens. Application view model, and it's got a login command. And that does do login. And do login basically says, 
go and get the client application, which is something that we've, that we've created in the application that does the authentication, and call this thing called acquire token async. And acquire token async is the, is the key piece that is going to go off and display all the things that need to display. That's what the, the MSAL, the, the authentication library, is going to do. And once we do that, once we go and do this login command, we can automatically, once the token's been created, once, once the token's been accepted, inject that into all of our calls to the graph. Yeah, so the graph calls all get injected with this bearer, this bearer token, the authorization token. Yeah, but it all happens. That's where all the magic happens to do the actual logging in piece. That's all you've got to write. So there's some great information about that as well on, the, on that blog I'm going to show you in a sec. All right. That's a, a whirlwind run through that, uh, that demo. Okay, I've got a bunch of resources. In fact, I don't expect you to take photos or write all of these down because there's lots of them here. Um, many, several, several many slides. Um, but some great, some great stuff around Excel development and the developer session, Excel developer session at Ignite, um, and Xamarin Forms and Graph session at Ignite. Um, I'll wait for the cameras to go down because there's plenty more. Are we done? Yeah. Um, some graphs on the graph and landing, landing page. I'm not going to start for all of these because there's you can see the things that are up there, and you can grab these slides later. Um, there's a, a really good Office developer show on the Microsoft Authentication Library with Vittorio Batali, who's the guy who wrote it. Definitely worth checking that out. And another good show on the Excel REST API with Gina and um, Richard uh, de Zarega. Um, if you want to run the iOS simulator on Windows, you can't actually run it on Windows, but you can remote to it. I've never actually got it working. But there is a way, apparently, of it happening. I just can't get it to go. Um, and I've had a good chat with the guys at Xamarin. You may have more luck. I've certainly seen it working on other machines. just never works on mine. Um, so it's probably a failing on my part. Uh, it's a great set of blogs on the Xamarin site around um, MSAL on, and Forms, which is where that this um, where, where that um, uh, uh, the, I, I, I gave you a link to that before. Uh, and um, there's also a heap of great stuff on GitHub uh, around um, uh, uh, using the graph uh, uh, with um, uh, with MSAL as well. Some great videos from Build and from Ignite. Uh, and also some really good things on office, the office blogs. So heaps of great resources. I'd strongly encourage you to grab these, um, grab these uh, slides and have a look through that stuff. It really is quite straightforward to get this stuff going. Now, I'm going to push questions off for a moment, and I'll take them in a sec because I know it's afternoon tea time and why the tidy way stands between hungry developers and afternoon tea. But I do want to leave you with this before we go to questions. If you can take advantage of the power that Office 365 and the Microsoft Graph and Xamarin and Xamarin Forms give you, then you've basically enabled your superpowers. So that's what I expect you to do. Thanks. Evans, questions? 